Um, over time, I've sat in possibly 10 boards, and certainly John is the most impressive director I've seen. Calm, rational, logical, asks good questions, uh, and always helps to provide good clarity. So we're delighted to have John here today. Now, for those of you who think John's experience is at the corporate level, but we've asked him to talk about strategy and development, and for those of you who think will say that this is not relevant to farming, you're absolutely wrong. So th th this could be one of the most important sessions you've ever listened to. So I, I, I want all of you to actually think of what John is talking about, linking it back to your own farming business. How can you actually relate it to your own farming business? And what's furthermore, actually build in some of the principles that John will talk about. Delighted to have you, John. Thanks, Michael. Uh, after the stretching and all of that, I'll be booking for the second tour. I won't be going on the one led by him. <laughs> so um, anyway, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here and to meet some familiar faces. Um, uh, from uh, down the years. Uh, I should say at the outside ask what Michael asked me to talk about and I wrote it down for the avoidance of doubt. Uh, some comments on becoming more strategic, more business-like, growth in a planned way, team development, personal development, growth at low risk and risk management and after that if we could fix Brexit, the next reform of the common agricultural policy. So. I'm not sure how much of that I'll get, or, uh, but I hope you'll get something out of what I have to say. It will come over probably a bit corporately, but that's been my experience. It's 40 years since I milked cows. I don't know if that's good or bad, but um, nevertheless, it is there in my experience base. And uh, with the companies, including DCC, not many people know who DCC is, but some of the brands we have are Flow Gas is a DCC brand, Great Gas, Petrol, Emo Oils, Fannin Healthcare, uh, and with uh, Creelsha, Smurfit Kappa, and Greencore, which I also do a bit of work apart from, from my experience in Glanby, I'll try and reflect some of the things in this theory that I present about strategy. And because strategy sometimes can be better looking backwards as well, if we're all absolutely honest, that we found a particular niche and had the courage to follow it or the insight to follow it, and you can retrofit things. Uh, so, we'll see how it goes, um, and if we can get this to work. So, the first structured program I ever did as a lowly supervisor in Meadow Meats in Raddowney in County Leash as a management trainee, raw and green out of UCD with a BAG, uh, I was sent off on a training program, and a guy put this slide up, and it has stayed with me ever since. Because for me, this is the essence of management. There's a kind of a leadership thing which is a bit outside of it or around it. But there are three key bits. Achieve the task, build teams, and develop individuals. And if you can get all those three running together, you get a sweet spot in the middle there that's colored in that can really get a business or an organization humming. And as organizations get bigger, the approach to all of those things becomes more complex. You have to systemize it, get processes around it from HR to accountability to audit systems. But the essence of anybody who is managing even one person is contained in that. Achieve the task, build teams, and develop people. Because that's ultimately what makes a business self-sustaining, gets people up into managing and thinking and working on the business as opposed to working in it. And there's an interesting phrase I, I heard recently, which is as, just as applicable to this audience, I'm sure, as any. Um, the leader of, of Delata Hotels talking in a hotel, uh, Pat McCann, and he made the, fra fr the, the reference, the manager of the particular hotel we're in, his name is Pat McCann, he said, he's in the hotel business but I'm in the business of hotels. I have chosen hotels as an area to invest in. So there are a wide sweep of people here, I'm sure, who are in the business of farming and people who are in the farming business. And how you think about all that and how you allocate capital and make investment decisions 
all plays around that. So uh, to move on then and talk a bit about strategy. Uh, strategy and some of this uh, Jim Wolfe might have touched on I gather this morning, but there was a, a smart guy called Michael Porter in Harvard in 1979 wrote a great paper on the five forces, five competitive forces that shape the strategy of any business or any industry. But for me, when I read it, I got one thing out of it, and it's this sentence, that the essence of strategy is coping with competition. And if you think about it as a dairy industry, it even goes back to the first the piece that Michael introduced there. For Ireland in the long run, coping with competition is the essence of any strategic development that we would want to pursue in Ireland, or any strategic development that you want to pursue at a farm, or any way you would want to improve or expand your farming business. How do you be more competitive so that you outcompete uh, the other guy or the other country? And more broadly, it, you can talk about where and how to compete to counteract the competitive forces that would inexorably deplete profits. And the lesson from that is as well is if you don't grow sensibly and in a planned way, well, the, the other way is to stand still. And if you're standing still, by definition, you're going backwards. So when Porter talked about the five forces, there's, and you think about this in the dairy industries, there's a threat of new entrants. They can be new countries. You can have bargaining power of suppliers, bargaining power of the customers we sell to, substitute products for uh, dairy, probably not going to happen in a global sense, there's a lot more almond milk and coconut milk in fridges around the country today than there were before. And then there's the industry itself, continually jockeying for position. Who gets knocked out? Who falls behind? There were the five forces he talked about. And the concept of building scale, or going up the experience curve so you reduce your unit costs, is also a critical factor in sustaining the performance of a business over time. So in Dairy Ireland, we're in a global market. The cost structure and productivity is crucial. And that has to fall down to every individual firm and every individual farm, it seems to me, in the system. And I completely agree with the piece exact, uh, that grass is a key strategic advantage that we need to continue to drive productivity in. So the benefits and returns that people get is really driven by how they chose to play and how they think about growing their business carefully over the long term. So people talk about horizons, and there are horizons of growth. And um, anyone who's interested in reading on this is a really good book written about 15 years ago called The Alchemy of Growth by three or four guys out of McKinsey and Company. And if you think about it, uh, you've got to start with a base. And the crucial thing to understand is where are you today? There's an awful lot of people actually don't really know. They're not unsure of their performance. They don't have the right metrics. And they may not be standing in the position that best sets them up to move forward. You know, it's like the tourist that stopped the guy down in Dingle and asked him for directions to Dublin. And the canny Kerry man, with due respect to all Kerry people here, looked at him for a while and he said, if I was you, I wouldn't start from here. So, Horizon One is the core business. And that's the home farm, if you're thinking about going to another unit. Or it's the home farm and you're thinking of acquiring land and expanding. It's the business that is thinking about getting into a new geography. It is the business that's thinking about getting into some new products down the road. And the crucial bit in the first part is that you have to earn the right to grow. Now, what do I mean by that? Earning the right to grow means that that business in Horizon One at the core is generating, is operating to the optimum performance, is generating cash, has a high performance culture, is appropriately resourced, and is then the bedrock from which you're generating cash to invest in closer in businesses and maybe some further out options for the future. And if you move beyond that core and it is not performing to its optimum level, 
then you're pretty much predetermined to get into trouble. And that's a proven fact of business history and of commercial history. So generating sufficient cash in the core, the culture of it is right, to push earnings, that it's at best cost versus the industry. And in farming, it seems to me, because it's often a solitary occupation, it's great for people to come to events like this. And people would say to me, in any kinds of business, we think we're really good at this, and I would say, how do you know? Have you benchmarked yourself against another business, somebody else, that's been one of the great advances, advances, I think, that discussion groups have driven here. So in, in Horizon One and the core business, where it's all about extending the core and defending it, then it's about execution, it's about effectiveness, it's about having a bit of a growth mindset, but more importantly, it's about creating the capacity for growth, the right to grow. When we were, Michael mentioned a bit of the history of Glambia, when we were looking at the business back in 2000 when the share price was 60p and we had a lot of debt and poor returns on capital and a poor operating margin down at around two and a half percent two, two and three quarter percent from memory we did an exercise like this which read is set about what what was the core what are we going to be involved in we were in meat businesses beef lamb pork businesses in the uk with over capacity and we decided what businesses we were going to be in and why, and what businesses we were going to get out of and recycle that capital. And out of that, the model that is the Glanbia business today came back 17 or 18 years ago. And fundamentally, one of the things we saw further out was that, uh, and this is a strategy looking backwards, where Glanbia became the biggest cheese producer in the United States. You could argue it was an accident uh, that part of a business we had in Wisconsin had a small, tiny 2,000 ton cheese factory in a place called Richview, Idaho. But Idaho uh, began to see a change. Dairy farmers started to move out of California because of environmental pressure and move where they could put in big confined animal systems with less environmental restrictions in Idaho. And there we were with this small 2,000 ton cheese factory. And we, we had the sense to say, sell everything else and let's go there. And we built that up. And then the Horizon 2 was starting to use the protein from the whey. And now Glanbia has Horizon 3 bets in specific grass-based proteins and going to consumers, stepping out along that. Similarly, for example, in Creelcha, we grow trees. We're the biggest supplier to the sawmill sector. We process all the thinnings in the country into panels which is the next stage for us in Clonmel and Waterford. And we've just invested in an acetylization process in Hull in England. Why? Because we can bring unique technology in the future back to the panels business that will give a panel an outdoor life of 30 years. So fixing the core, generating cash, and investing in businesses that step out into the future. So you need different people for each of these stages as well. You need operators in the Horizon One, comfortable with the nitty gritty and the detail, and are going to get to grips with change, with getting the business to really perform and throw off cash. The second phase is kind of leadership and having a bit of a vision for it. And the, the challenging thing for people in the farming business, it seems to me, is you've got to be a bit of all three. But most of you, I'd say, are well capable of that. And then Horizon Three is a bit of a visionary way out there, 10 and 15 years, what might we place a bet on? So when you're thinking about this, uh, there are some questions to ask yourself. Uh, it's very important to frame the right questions. Why do you want to grow? What's the purpose? And how might you do it? It's crucial in that first phase to have a diagnosis of where and how money is made, the effectiveness of your, your, your system, of your grassland management system, your husbandry systems, animal health, animal welfare, leading to superior animal performance. That's crucial in the diagnosis. And then where do you want to plan, what do you want to plan for in the future? Because there's no point in a farming audience, it seems to me, having this very corporately. It's personal, 
it's family, it's lifestyle. Why do you want to do this? And then if you're happy with the answers you get there, then what are the steps and the pathways? And I'm a great believer in planning these things in a staircase. Because once you step up one, you, like any physical staircase, you see more. And then you step up another bit and you see more. Change then, when you've got to pick, any good strategy for development should have a couple of alternatives because it's a choice between alternatives. And over the years in Glanbia, that's something we got better at, planning. Planning not in, in an end in itself. Uh, Eisenhower once said that plans are nothing, planning is everything. And I interpreted that to mean, and for those of you who are younger than I am, Eisenhower led the invasion of Europe. Uh, and I interpret that to mean you've considered the scenarios. And few battle plans fail, face first contact with the enemy. You know, uh, one of the heavyweights said one time that uh, every, every boxer's got a plan until he gets punched in the mouth. And so when the plan has to change, you have done the planning, you've thought about different scenarios, and you can adapt and react. And that's what makes a difference in these kind of scenarios. And that's why planning is important. And then when you make the change, you have to drive change. And that's a real challenge in any business. People being clear about why we're changing, where we're going, what's the reason, and bringing people with you. Even if it's only one or two or three other people, but that they make a difference in your business, then communication and all that goes with that is crucial. And then you step up another bit and you see more. Change then, when you've got to pick, any good strategy for development should have a couple of alternatives because it's a choice between alternatives. And over the years in Glanbia, that's something we got better at, planning. Planning not in, in an end in itself. Uh, Eisenhower once said that plans are nothing, planning is everything. And I interpreted that to mean, and for those of you who are younger than I am, Eisenhower led the invasion of Europe. Uh, and I interpret that to mean you've considered the scenarios and few battle plans fail, face first contact with the enemy. You know, uh, one of the heavyweights said one time that uh, every, every boxer's got a plan until he gets punched in the mouth. And so when the plan has to change, you have done the planning, you've thought about different scenarios and you can adapt and react. And that's what makes a difference in these kind of scenarios. And that's why planning is important. And then when you make the change, you have to drive change. And that's a real challenge in any business. People being clear about why we're changing, where we're going, what's the reason, and bringing people with you. Even if it's only one or two or three other people, but that they make a difference in your business, then communication and all that goes with that is crucial. And then you've got to evolve. So you've got to learn. Everybody's learning. I never subscribe to the theory of the all-seeing, all-knowing chief executive. Particularly today with the march of technology, the leader in any business must be really open to information, to communication, to new ways of learning, to coming to events like this, to meeting experts or so-called experts. So building staircases to growth and thinking about why you want to do it, it seems to me, are crucial points and then thinking about the best options for the resources you have at a point in time or will have when you implement some changes around your core business to get that to cash flow better in order to provide the resources and to earn the right to grow. So in, in those early 2000 days in Glanbia, for example, we had to earn the right to grow. We couldn't borrow any more money from the banks, we couldn't raise any more money from shareholders. So we had to decide what businesses we would get out of use that cash and reinvest it in businesses we thought had a better prospect for growth. And they were very difficult decisions. I remember we shut down a cooked meats plant in the UK, had 700 people working at it, and we closed it because the industry had 30% spare capacity. You could never make money. It was hemorrhaging cash. So we just decided to shut it. So in thinking about uh, some other points to consider, the value chain is crucial, and you will get everybody here should understand that. How do you maximize cash in your business and how you're making money? I mean, if you're not from soil to sward through animal performance, 
if you haven't that figured out as the key underpin of, of the, and I'm not telling uh, anybody to suck eggs here, but that's the crucial bit. And then what really underpins performance? And don't get distracted because daring is a cyclical business. It has to be ultimately about the core productivity of your operation. Don't get distracted by stage in the cycle, up or down. What can you sustain in terms of operational productivity over time in terms of the business? And any business that gets distracted becoming there's great returns in that area today, in this particular business sector. That may be today, so you need to figure out the markets and how they're going to evolve and ultimately how you're going to compete in that context. Also, we're thinking about, done this in the past as well, have you got privileged assets? The little cheese business in Idaho turned out to be a privileged asset, a nugget that we unearthed in, in the group. Are there special relationships? Have you got special relationships with advisors, with providers of finance, with people who can support you in the skills to grow a business? That's crucial. And most important of all, it's debate. It's enabling open and constructive and challenging debate around the proposition of growth and why. And then capability, operational skills, privileged assets. Talk about that. So in terms of implementation, when you go to implement it, that's the fun bit. And for me, execution is key. I'd rather have a mediocre plan really well executed than a great plan poorly executed. Many years ago, I went off and did a diploma in, in project management because I met this guy with a whole strategic plan for a big business, big business a grouping of businesses, and he carried around the strategic plan on a set of project plans because it was all about implementation. So it was building the next milk and parlor, whatever it is, what's the project plan, who's responsible, who are the key parties, what are the timelines, when, and you focus really on time, quality, and cost, and who's responsible for the different elements. And there's a great skill in projects of breaking them down into what they call the work breakdown schedule, of breaking it down into manageable chunks. It's the same way the mouse at the elephant in small pieces, but it's manageable chunks and the discipline of project management, the skills of project management, I couldn't recommend highly enough to anybody in any business. Because crucial with that then is having the right people on the bus to do stuff. And people must know what they need to do differently if you're going to expand a business, get into a new area, or just keep growing at a pace above where you have been for prior years. And how and why we're doing it, and that it's resourced. There's no point in the car running out of petrol halfway along the journey. So that's part of the planning bit have thought that through and to provide for some what-if scenarios to ensure the resources are going to be capable of getting you there. And that's why you build out the key goals over time to ensure everybody's clear what are the milestones, what it takes to get there, what are the resources required and what are the cash or other buffers that are needed. Being entrepreneurial and, and dynamic learning. In DCC we've bought 200 businesses over the last 10, 12 years. And those businesses, the guys, if we're happy with the management we get with those businesses, we leave them there with the, with, the, with the view that this is your business. You're responsible for running this and being entrepreneurial. You get support from the head office and we will keep a loose grip on the throat in terms of financial metrics and operating performance. But people at a business unit level are really encouraged to be entrepreneurial, to have a sense of ownership about the business and to drive it forward uh, based on their own plans. It's important to take stock when you're growing and when, you're, when you've entered into new areas. What's working? What isn't? If it isn't working, stop it and do something different. Fix it and move on. Sometimes we can spend a lot of time angsting about is that guy really suitable for that role where we are now? And the reality is he or she could do more damage the longer we leave them there. And if I learned anything, particularly on, on people actions, you're better to act earlier 
and sooner rather than later and get the right person onto the bus. Because the right talent in operations, leaders or visionaries for different phases of growth is crucial. So this is a busy slide and I'm not sure whether it's going to be overly re relevant but for, but for what it is. If a business is performing and wants to be a high performing business, this is a tool that McKinsey have been using for 20 years to go in and look at businesses along these axes. And if you look down the center, direction, leadership, environment and values, that's kind of the internal bit. So from a direction point of view, you know, is it clear? What's the path we're on? Why we're on it? Is it understood by others involved in the business with you? The leadership, does it shape how people do things? Is it inspiring? And down at the bottom, environmental and values, you know, why we're doing it, the core, the core things that are drivers in the business. It's not, about, it's not about environmental and environmental, physical environmental sense. It's about the quality of interaction with employees. It's about understanding. It's about people having trust in the organization and why they're motivated to be there. So direction, leadership, and environment are kind of internal pieces. And every business has different focuses or emphasis on those. In, in direction, in some companies, it's very numerative, it's very operational, and it's very clear. For example, Ryanair is all about a standard process, top-down driven, same aircraft type, same approach, anytime you get on board. Right? The original model, Southwest, was driven by people highly motivated to be working there because it was an open, engaging atmosphere. It was a completely different model, completely different leadership style in Southwest Airlines, which was the original budget airline in the world. Going across the centre then, you have external and innovation, and that's probably the outward looking bit. And that's how well you're set up to build linkages, coming to things like this, gathering information, talking to suppliers, talking to customers, getting information that can help you to think about how you need to keep repositioning the business. And what do you do to do that? The innovation bit also means external, and it's, not about, being, it's about not being afraid to fail. And it's important that organizations and any business create, it's not heroic failure now, that gets bloody expensive. But it's about an environment which is about not being afraid to try new things. Because the man who never made a mistake or woman who never made a mistake never made anything. And therefore, that's those bits across there. And after that, accountability, the responsibility, the routines, the weekly, the monthly, the quarterly, the annual, coordination and control. It's different for every business. Some like to centralize it. Big global corporation like ExxonMobil, every decision goes to Houston. Every decision over a very minimum level goes to Houston. It's very centralized in, co in terms of coordination and control. And then you have capability and motivation. Capability about the skills. What do you need to have? in terms of the capacity of people in the organization. And in terms of motivation, why would they want to be there? And that's going to be a big challenge for expanding dairy farms and multiple farming operations over the years ahead. Getting good people and motivating them to be there. The world back 20 and 30 years is full of horror stories about a guy getting two sausages a day on a farm and that was it, you know? Uh, and I'm sure that's well and truly gone. But therefore, farm, farming, if we're to get 6,000 more people to work in this industry, people will have to consider why would people be motivated to come and do what you would ask them to do in this business, because you've got a vision to grow it, and there's, there's, a, there's a sustainable, positive future here. So every single business in the world has a different approach to every one of these. And the value is that you pay McKinsey a shitload of money and they give you back how you perform against it. But I thought there were, there were useful nine pointers to think about where you might stand against any one of these in your own business. 
uh, and about how you might think about changing the approach or not in any one of these in terms of growth and development. So moving on then to learning and innovation, uh, there's a, a phrase which is the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for a different outcome. So I think all of us in today's world as managers, as leaders in any business, any farming business, what you did well yesterday may not be sufficient for tomorrow because the pace of change in markets and technologies is such that it just won't do. And there's a good phrase that there is no, and I, I mentioned this earlier, there's no innovation or creativity without failure. And you can have innovation in a number of ways, in product, in the process, the, or the business model. And we're seeing lots of innovation in the business model in dairy farming today, with joint ventures, with share farming approaches, with leases, all of that are new ways in terms of the dairy farming business model in Ireland that are enabling people to grow. And all the time it must, it seems to me, have an eye on the customer or the market. What's really required? The, sh the, the shape of the product, the composition of the product you're putting out. And people therefore have to evolve be prepared to get out there and discover, and it's important to get insights. Ideas are grand, but actually an insight is far better. An insight is really something actionable, that you can actually do something about. You've got to ground an idea and figure out how it would work, but if you can get an insight into a, con a customer, a consumer, a process, a way of working, that can make a huge difference and, and cut out the timeline. And when you decide to do something new, then you have to make a clear bet Put some numbers on it. Is it going to make a difference? I am going, I think there's a, maybe I'm a, being a bit cynical, but there, there will be a terrible push at all sorts of businesses around technology. We have a new this, we have a new that. Is it going to make sense for your business? Is it going to put money on the bottom line? Is it going to free up your time to, so that you can do value adding things elsewhere? Try and put numbers on it. Because technology is, enable, is an enabler. It's not an end in itself. It enables you to release time that you can deploy elsewhere working on the business. It enables you to make productivity gains, but it's not an end in itself, except you want to get into the technology business uh, and don't get seduced by it. So I'll turn on now a bit to high performance. Um, and high performance is about really the nine things I talked about in the earlier slide about organizational help, health but also an understanding of why things are, why do things work the way they do in my business, on my farm, and is that right? And what would I, what would I do differently to get improvement and to challenge and, and really benchmark yourself as to what needs to be different? And doing that, getting that relentless focus all the time about is there a better way? but being sensible in grounding it then in numbers if you make a change, why is it going to be different and that it makes sense to the business overall. So as farming expands and dairy farms expand and businesses expand and high performing teams, go back to my original simple little slide, achieve the task, build teams, develop individuals. And for any team, it's about having stretching goals that can be achieved. They are stretching, but achievable. Because nothing succeeds like success, and where people have goals that they don't believe, based on thinking a bit about it, we're not going to get there. You've got to avoid that mindset. You've got to be able to focus on stuff. Yeah, this is going to be a mountain to climb, but we can get there because for the following two or three key reasons. And it's crucial in all of that because there will be zigs and zags that you keep an overall focus on overall objective. The overall objective is the following, link to your plan from the start. Where do I want to be and why do I want to be there? And keep reciting that and trusting that members of the team will deliver. If you don't trust that they are not going to deliver, then they shouldn't be on the team. And the only way to be clarify that with people is to have open and frank 
communication because that's a huge unifying force. People know why you're doing stuff. We are doing this because. And that will lead to the following if things go well. And a bit of mutual support and understanding for adversity and setbacks is always crucial. And I've said a number of times, it's crucial to have the right person on the team. The team and communication is probably the key to this as well, has to be clear about the values and live by them. And values are underpinned by a set of behaviors. So whatever you set are in any organization are a set of values. If the behaviors that happen in the business or in the organization don't support those, then it's all absolutely meaningless. If people say that people matter, but then there are no appropriate structures and systems in which people are developed and encouraged to grow, well then the value is irrelevant. People aren't going to believe it, they're not going to buy into it. Success is important to celebrate and giving and getting feedback is the breakfast of champions. Feedback, good and bad, is crucial in any team, in any business, and how you get it and how you set up to have someone you can talk to bounce ideas off, get feedback of how things are progressing is, somebody, is something every business should look to have. Leading. Uh, people talk a lot these days about agile leadership. You know, there was a time when uh, there was a lot of businesses, there was this guy up in the office in the West Wing and he issued a set of edicts and everybody went off and, and did it. That era is long over. The autocratic approach in today's fast-paced, technology-led world isn't going to work. People have to be much more agile, much more able to collaborate, to cooperate. Businesses that are set up on silos, where one part doesn't talk to the other, except they compete intensely for resources, I think that model is no longer tenable in the pace of today's world world of change, particularly driven by technology. So leadership must be far more agile. You as a leader or manager have to be clear about what are the priorities, where do you spend your time, and then what can you delegate? What, what makes sense for you to delegate internally or externally to an advisor, contractor, whatever? Being ruthless about time management is crucial. I'm sure you've heard all this before, but if you're, if you're leading and needing to spend time working on the business rather than in it, then being ruthless on your time management is crucial because you, as part of that and delegating, you've got to trust other people to perform and do what they're supposed to do, having been clear about what it is you expect them to do, and if it's not being done, then you've got to follow back on that loop. And crucially, it seems to me today in, in farming, as in many businesses, defining a work-life work balance is crucial and sticking to it as part of your overall planning. Planning it in, in terms of resourcing the business, in terms of time, but it's also allowing it to recharge the batteries, to have the energy, to make the right decisions at the right time when the pressure comes on. Because that, if you don't have that right, it seems to me, you can never be fully resilient. And being resilient in business is a key strength. Because there will always be bad news. There will be days when something will not go well and someone will come in and, and I have never found it but some bit of bad news. At the end of the day, if you think about it, there's going to be some kind of opportunity or some way you can deal with it. But if you don't have that resilience to step back and to think clearly, then you, make, you may make a bad situation worse. Last one, learning to say no. Um, and that's not in a, you know, an ungracious way, you know, no bugger off kind of a way. It's uh, about just being assertive. It's, I can't do that today because I need to address these other priorities. And too many people say yes to everything and then deliver badly on a lot of things on foot of it. Listening in all of this and leading is crucial. And we got two of these and one of these. 
two ears, and there's probably a reason, but we tend to use the, the, the mouth more than we do the ears. And it's pretty important to listen, and to listen actively. What do I mean by active listening? It means about some questions to clarify what the other pe person is saying. It's by focusing on the individual. If it's someone that works for you, you can't be distracted if they're coming at you with something. You've got to focus on them in that moment and be present and not be miles away. Otherwise, you're not going to hear the real message that's there. And there's more to be learned from active listening than there is in delivering a, a speech. And you've got to be able to adjust your style a bit. All leadership is situational. There will be times when you will need to put the boot in because the situation warrants it and there, should, there doesn't need to be a lot of discussion. Uh, hopefully, in your business, as in many businesses, that's rare. But when it's required, you need to be able to do it. And it's important then you're aware of your own style. You know, if you're not open, uh, how are you going to explain to people where you want to take the business? If you play your cards very close to your chest, but you have a couple of key people that work with you and support you, and you can't be open in that circumstance, how can you, help, how can you get them to really help you to, get, to take the business forward? So being conscious of your own style and being aware of it is important. So, uh, Michael, ladies and coming to the last couple of slides then that you asked me, um, when you get a business going then, there are, it's important that, that you're comfortable with how you fly the plane, the cockpit. What's the cockpit you want to have in front of you to fly the plane? What information do you need from the dials up in the cockpit? On a, on a, month, a weekly basis, a daily basis, a monthly basis? What suits you? What are the critical things you need to know to pull the levers, to make adjustments to the course of the ship or the flight of the plane? And hopefully in the plane it's the angle of, de of ascent, not the angle of decline. So in terms of measures, uh, I like this. We, we brought this in recently in, in um, Creelshire. And it's an interesting little, oh sorry, no, right now. Is that it? Sorry about that. Thanks, Aidan. So, Creelshire was a heavily centralised business with a head office of 60 people. So, what we've done is made it a head office of 20 people and pushed it down into three business units and then set up a series of dashboards for each of the three business units. So, the decision making is pushed down near where the action is not centralized in, in Newtown Mount Kennedy. And that's had a really profound effect on the organization and really profound in terms of generating operating cash flow. So the first set is measures, and that's about showing what happened. And it's only one of four you need to. We can spend an awful lot of time looking in a rear view mirror as to what happened. What happened last week or what month? You need to do a certain amount of it. And they should be quantitative, they should be financial, and they should be year to date. And you compare them to the plan and what happened this time last year. The next dial are indicators. And they're about what might happen in your best view over the next couple of months that you might need to address and think about. And they may be strategic indicators. You've got a plan. Are you on plan? Are you? Uh, are you off and why are you off and what, 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 what's affecting that? And they're useful as well to get internal bits into that. What's happening in dairy markets? What's likely to happen on milk price? Internal results, external forecasts, trends. So measures show what happened, indicators what might happen, and then quarterly forecasts is the first one is the key word. It's your best view of the future. So your best view of the future from the end of that quarter to the end of your financial year, whatever that is, it was the calendar year to the end of December. And in most businesses I am associated with, we do a forecast after the first quarter, the second quarter, and the third quarter out to the end of the year. And that's a few key commercial financial measures, focus on the year end and a rolling forecast. 
and always in there then, because you're looking out at the end of the year, put in risks and opportunities. What are the risks? What might happen to, to take you off forecast what, and the opportunities? What else could you do to counterbalance the risks? Always worth having a rolling risks and opportunities forecast. And then a strategic projects tracker. I believe in this everywhere. If you're doing some long-term projects that you've committed investment to, the project management discipline, you should be able to write all those down, whatever, whether there's one, three, ten, a hundred. Where are they as to time of delivery, cost and quality? And finally, risk management. Um, we live in a dynamic world. Every business faces risks. Uh, it's, I think it's increasingly important for businesses when you think of, and you can feed it back into your strategy, you can feed it back into how you manage the business, you can feed it back into resource use. But to develop at least a simple risk register, you can decide or have someone that you trust to sit down and push back with you on it. What should be on it? Financial risks, commercial risks, environmental, regulatory, health, safety, people risk, whatever else, a simple risk register prioritized and an assessment made of what's the likelihood of it happening. And if it happens, what's the impact in financial terms going to be in reputation, in stopping your business, in having you find what's the impact if it happened? And then how do you control it or mitigate it and have a few simple actions that you can track that are about trying to mitigate those risks and you review it regularly and keep it dynamic. There's a danger when you write a list like this that it put, goes on the shelf and thanks be to God we got that done, put it up there, it'll be grand. You gotta keep these things dynamic. So, ladies and gentlemen, I've tried to take you through hopefully what Michael asked. I hope it has some relevance or resonance for your own businesses. I'll apologize again if it was a bit too corporate-y, but many dairy farmers are incorporating today. And I'd be more than happy to take questions on any aspect or to debate issues with you uh, at the end of this. So thanks for your attention very much.